Hello, and welcome to Right On, the podcast from Final Draft. We are here to talk about all things screenwriting. I'm your host, Phil Galasso. Today we have a really fun episode. I had the chance to chat with Kate Hagen, the director of community for our friends over at The Blacklist. We chatted about some of the surprises from this year's Oscar ceremony, her work supporting writers with The Blacklist, her advice for new creatives looking to break into the industry, and more. This was a lot of fun. I think you'll enjoy it. I am here with Kate Hagen, the director of community for The Blacklist. Kate, thank you for taking the time to chat with me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, super stoked to talk on this uh, post-Oscars Monday. Yeah, it's the Monday, April 26th, the day of our Lord, 2021. And the day after the Oscars, what was the longest Oscar like award season in freaking history? Um, so let's talk about last night's show while it's still fresh. Uh, what, what did you think? What were your, your big takeaways? You know, I got to say, honestly, my night was thrown when I realized the awards were not going to be in the usual order that they appear in. Like when I realized Best Supporting Actor was not going to be first, I was like thrown for the rest of the evening. I do think starting with screenplay was cool because, you know, it all starts there. And so like thematically, I thought that was actually kind of interesting. But one nice thing, so I usually do the press room for the Oscars and I did it this year as well. But one nice thing that usually happens in the in-person press room is at the top of the show you get a list of all the awards orders so you can at least kind of like prepare your coverage but it was very weird not having that context and then just kind of being thrown into the deep end Mm -hmm. I think everybody was sort of thrown by the best picture not being the final award of the night yeah I get shuffling the order otherwise but I think best picture has to be last guys just like fundamentally I think that's what everybody watches for I miss the little drum roll they always do uh yeah I mean I, I my understanding is that the the risk that they took, the producers of the show took, was that Chadwick Boseman was going to win, and they thought it would be a sort of very, you know, emotional uh, ending to the to the ceremony. But you know that which you can debate that whether that was appropriate or not. But yeah, the the way it ended was anticlimactic. Let's say. <laughs> yeah. And it's just, it's a really big gamble to take on Chadwick, definitely winning Best Actor. I felt a little weirded out by seeing the the NFT that was made of Chadwick Boseman, too, afterwards. I don't know, it just did not feel like the right sort of note to marry with, you know, regardless of, of who wins awards and things like that. It just felt a little bit strange to me as like a giveaway. Yeah. But, you know, I I think you're right that this was a really long award season. I think everybody was just pretty exhausted by the end of it. You know, I... I didn't see Sound of Metal at Tor- Toronto 2019, but like thinking about a movie like that that's been out there for, you know, well over a year at this point, it it sort of felt like the the very last sprint in a very long marathon last night. Yeah, for sure. And I, you know, I appreciated some of the other tweaks to the show. I mean, I think it moved at a clip. I liked letting the the the, the uh, winners speak longer, not playing them off. I thought that was good. And it led to some gold, certainly with Daniel Kaluuya and uh, um, others. So I thought that was cool. I was okay. I saw a lot of people on social media complaining about the lack of clips. I was okay with that. It, it felt to me like the, the show felt to me like an intimate party geared towards people who were already like sort of in the bag for these movies and for the Oscars. It wasn't like, an award show meant for people who haven't heard of these movies or anything like that. I think it just sort of took for granted, like you're either in on this or you're not. And here you go. Yeah. And I do think there's a tension that exists there though, as you sort of like, I totally dig what they were doing in terms of uh, making it a more intimate ceremony. I actually liked how it felt like kind of throwbacky to like the early Oscars banquets and things like that. And like you were saying, you know, having these longer speeches from people, you get some things that you don't normally get. But, you know, maybe this makes me a grandma, but I really miss things like the the magic of movies montages, like, you know, dance numbers that sort of have a unifying theme. And obviously that stuff is highly hit or miss. But I think about being a little kid and watching the Oscars and seeing a montage about like, you know, the magic of cinematography. And you're like, what are all these movies? Like, mm-hmm. there's so much I have to discover. And I think if you watched last night, there wasn't a lot of curiosity for sort of film 
film history for how we got to here. And, you know, I don't want to blame this show in particular. I think that's been the trend for the last couple of years, as it particularly as they try to attract younger viewers. But I do think there's a bit of a disservice being done to sort of the, the history of the Oscars and all of the incredible winners that have come before and the films that have been made and sort of minted by the Oscars. And I don't know, it just feels like there's some room for some more of that within the context of the show. Yeah, I've always, you know, one of the things I always read about and you never actually get to see is the Governor's Awards. The, you know, uh, they, they have a whole separate ceremony and like that's, it's honoring all these, you know, lots of lifetime achievement style awards and stuff. And I've always wanted to see that televised. It feels like a missed opportunity for like, I don't know, Hulu or one of the streamers to, you know, it, it seems at this point, put any award ceremony on, on basic television on like, you know, on a network television is kind of just a losing, you know, audience viewership is down every year for everything. It seems like it's about time for a streamer or someone to say, you know what, we're going to reinvent this, you know, we're going to, we don't care if the show runs four and a half hours long, we don't care if, you know, we're, we're doing it over two nights and we're honoring these people here and these people there. Like, I feel like that's the kind of step that needs to be taken. And otherwise, I don't know what you can do, but, you know, having these on ABC every year anymore or try and trying to fit it in three hours. Like, I think they've tried everything that you can, you can try at this point. Well, and like, you know, hardcore Oscar people don't care if it's three hours or five hours. Like you're, you've done that buy-in already. Like mm-hmm. I get, I get the sort of wanting to make it a more palatable award show for the, the general public, but I don't know that sort of the ways in which they've cut back have been the most appropriate choices to sort of get us there. I really miss things like the honorary Oscars, you know, like I remember being a kid and seeing like Blake Edwards or Robert Altman or um, like Jack Cardiff get an honorary Oscar. And it's like, I don't know who this person is, but I should figure this out. And you do miss that. Like uh, my favorite actress is Jenna Rollins and she got an honorary Oscar a couple of years ago. And it killed me that I had to like, you know, look up clips on YouTube the next Mm -hmm. day. It's like, this should be on TV. She's with Spike Lee. Like, what are we doing? Yeah, for sure. Well, let's talk about some of the actual winners of the show. So one of, one of the ones I want to talk about is Promising Young Woman, because I know Promising Young Woman was on the blacklist and I believe 2018. Yeah, yeah. Promising Young Woman was on the blacklist in 2018, and that's about as fast of a sort of track for um, production as I've seen for any movie. You know, it just made the list in 2018, and here we are in 2021, and the film has won an Oscar. I think it was an incredibly fast production um, situation for that film, which is fascinating, you know, uh, seeing the ways in which some films, like something like Carol, takes, I think, uh, Phyllis Nagy had 17 years to gestate and then something like that which goes so quickly always just really interesting sort of industry studies yeah and so for listeners who you know I'm sure they know of what the blacklist is but talk about from you know a writer's perspective someone like Emerald Fennell talk about you know what what the journey from uploading your script into the to the blacklist to you know ultimately production and winning an Oscar now talk about just kind of the steps that in between there what what is what, what happens there you know no, I do think Emerald is a is an interesting example because Emerald is an actor of some acclaim and had, you know, worked in this space before and sort of knew the things necessary to get the film made. And I do think that's a very different experience than a writer who is, you know, just starting out or using the Blacklist website. I do want to clarify, though, because this is something that happens pretty frequently. Um, You know, the annual Blacklist and the Blacklist website are two totally different entities. We have had scripts crossover that have been on the Blacklist website that have gone on to make the annual Blacklist. But sometimes there is the expectation that, you know, doing well on the Blacklist website website or, you know, being on the top list there will then translate into making the annual blacklist when in fact that's not the case. The annual blacklist is voted on by hundreds of executives around town um, based on the last year. Um, And it's just a it's a totally different thing than the way the website works. But, you know, I think it's really interesting. I have read a number of interviews with Emerald Fennell talking about all of the support she had, particularly from Lucky Chap, who were on board for her co-producers and they seem to have a real directive to be making a female driven story and doing what needs to be done to get those projects off the ground sooner rather than later. I think we saw it too with Margot Robbie bringing Kathy Yan onto Birds of Prey and sort of getting that project off the ground really quickly. Um, but, you know, I think Promising Young Woman is one of those scripts that elicits a reaction no matter who reads it. And I can definitely see 
if you are Carrie Mulligan sort of reading that script and having a really big reaction and wanting to attach to it. So I definitely think things like that happen in terms of the production process too. But, you know, it is interesting, like, you know, Promising Young Woman played Sundance at the beginning of 2020 and thinking about these sort of long shelf lives of films. Like I know one of the classic examples is like, you know, Silence of the Lambs came out in February and still won Best Mm -hmm. Picture, which is a rarity. We have these sort of ideas of the fall festival season, fall awards season, and to see that sort of timeline disrupted in a way this year I thought was really interesting. And just the sort of, you know, I I would be curious to see Promising Young Woman, all of this year's releases, you know, if this is a normal uh, year, if the nominations still look the same at the end Mm -hmm. of the year, if the sort of race go the same way that they did if there's the sort of general movie going public seeing these films if there's you know the sort of wine and dine award season push that usually happens but you know we will never know because this is the moment we're in and we are dealing with uh pandemic release schedules and pandemic oscars so yeah it's all just sort of interesting i'll be very curious to see our sort of 30,000 foot view on all of this stuff in like five or 10 years. Yeah. And I think this year is the year that it's going to revert back to 10 nominations for best picture now all the time. It's not going to have the, not going to be flexible like it has been the past few years. Yeah. I'll be, I'll be curious as well. Cause obviously a lot of the studios pulled back there. What would have been bigger budget, bigger, more, you know, things they held them back. So which ones of them would have ended up making the cut? I mean, you know, I saw this the statistics saying that like this year had the lowest grossing best picture nominees ever. And it's like, well, yeah. <laughs> we were in a pandemic. We I wonder why. In a pandemic. <laughs> uh, most people should not be going to movie theaters yeah. yet. Uh, yeah, it seems like Nomadland, like the, the, you know, the enthusiasm for that sustained itself, you know, for almost an entire year. And it's some, you know, it managed to pull it off at the end, which was pretty cool. Um, were there any other awards last night you were excited to see? Yeah, you know, I thought there were some some interesting choices. I thought Daniel Kaluuya extremely deserved for Judas and the Black Messiah. Um, Yoo Jung Yoon gave an absolutely wonderful speech. I thought she perhaps had the best sort of speech moment of the night. Um, and just really nice to see, uh, you know, this came up sort of in the, the press room, but something nobody really talks about is... Um, age diversity within the awards and the fact that you know yes sometimes we award older actors but that's generally not the norm the academy loves a sort of star making performance and it's really great to see uh Yoo Jung Yoon like win her first award, first major American award at an age where a lot of actors are sort of you know gracefully sort of fading out of their careers and I'm just really excited for what the potential now holds for her now that she is an Oscar winner and can sort of use that going forward i'm trying to think if there was anything else that sort of stood out to me i did see that she has she has um apparently a a reality show uh where her and um other actresses open up pop-up restaurants in random locations around the world they've done a few seasons of that and i'm desperate for netflix or someone to pick that up it seems like it'd be a no-brainer yeah, right. That's like that's free, excellent content. We would love to see it. Um, yeah, I thought the whole sort of Minari team was really lovely throughout this whole award season. And I thought, you know, that's a movie that, uh, you know, I don't know sort of where the other awards would have come in for it. But something like that, that's like, you know a Korean story, an American story, a Korean American story feels like the sort of films we should be absolutely minting at the Oscars. So it's like, you know, it's one of those years where you sort of wish there were more awards or like that was a movie to me that would have been like ideal for like a best ensemble award. Mm -hmm. I, that's one of my hills I love to die on. I don't understand why there's not an ensemble or casting director Oscar. Yeah, and stunts. It's like, guys, these are huge parts of these films. We should award these folks appropriately. Um, But yeah, you know, I honestly thought the ceremony itself, like, given the circumstances, given the sort of context of this year, flowed really well. It was just, you know, some of these big changes, I think, were very jarring to folks like, you know, like us who have watched every Oscar ceremony Mm. and have a sort of expectation of how things are going to go. But, you know, hats off to the producers of the show for making a COVID safe environment and making sure everybody was well taken care of and could still have a good time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I do want to real quickly before we just move on, just talk about uh, snubs because the big for me the the movie that I 
can't believe wasn't nominated across the board was Defy Bloods. I mean, Delroy Lindo specifically was like the biggest head scratch of them all for me, but I was bummed not to see that represented more. Were there any films that you were hoping to see represented more that weren't there? Yeah, you know, for me, Delroy was the biggest snub of the year. That was just like so clearly the a best supporting actor moment to me and not to take anything away from Daniel Kaluuya who I think is fantastic and Judas and the Black Messiah but somebody like Delroy Lindo you do sort of wonder how many more opportunities there are going to be for him to get a part this good to sort of be elevated for the award season and you really hope that you know that wasn't sort of it and we missed it you know 2020 was an interesting movie year for me generally i think i saw fewer new movies than i have in like the last 10 years um and a lot of that is pandemic viewing a lot of that is me sort of watching things at home catching up on things um feeling like you know it's easier to watch like a c minus 80s horror movie than it is some of these movies which i'm sure are wonderful and extremely well done but my you know idiot baby brain is like no writer for animator is what we need instead um but yeah, I'm trying to, you know, there were a couple things I thought flew under the radar that I really liked last year that weren't necessarily awards movies. I really liked uh, Carl Mir- Mirabella Davis's Swallow. I thought that was a really interesting genre film, you know, but then that being said, too, like I saw The Father at Sundance and was like, yeah, that was really great. I really enjoyed that. I, you know, n- nobody is like super psyched to watch a movie about the ravages of dementia. But I thought for a movie that is exploring that really difficult subject, it was extremely compelling. The performances are amazing. They really did something with the language of cinema. So, you know, ultimately, I was glad to see that take home a couple of words last night. But yeah, you know, it's I, I think everybody's habits sort of shifted this year in all sorts of different ways. You know, I know some people are like, I just watch reality TV now because that's all my sort of brain will onboard after a, a, you know, another week in the pandemic. So it's, you know, to me, it's more of a curiosity than any kind of judgment um, on what people are watching or not watching. Um, But yeah, it's all just very interesting to see all of that stuff evolve. For sure. Um, to just stepping back away from the Oscar stuff now, um, let's just talk, I want to talk a little bit about the blacklist and your role there. So can you talk about what you, you know, what you do on a day to day and and the blacklist in general, what, you know, um, the different things and, um, services you offer for people? Yeah. You know, it's, I celebrated, uh, my seventh anniversary sort of in this role with the blacklist. Oh, Um, congrats. Yeah really exciting it's uh you know joking that it's now like the longest relationship that i've had in my life but it is and i was reading for the blacklist for about six months before i got hired in this role so i've been in the family since august 2013 uh which is a really long time and it's been so awesome to sort of be a part of watching the company grow and what I mean is not like the sort of traditional success metrics and things like that, but getting to see writers who have come through the ecosystem sort of blossom and watch their careers explode and watch the ways in which they they can continue developing as writers and continue sharing their stories with the world, you know. We've now had a couple, I shouldn't say a couple more than a couple, many of the folks that come through our screenwriting labs have gone on to continued success, whether that's, you know, selling TV pitches, getting staffed on shows, getting their film set up, getting hired for open assignments, getting hired for adaptations, um, all sorts of things. And that to me has been the most exciting thing about the job is just getting to know these incredible writers and then, you know, sort of getting out of the way and letting them continue their ascent in the industry. You know, we're happy to help how we can with things like the website and the labs, but really we just want to provide support and affirmation for these writers that their stories matter and that you know we want to see them in the world but I should take a step back from that so (laughs) my technical job title for the blacklist is director of community but we all wear many hats all of the time um so my day-to-day is really different it really depends on the day it really depends on you know what's happening especially as we've gotten into more film and television production over the last couple of years but it's a little bit of everything you know I'm doing our social 
social media. I am handling website partnerships. We all sort of split responsibility there, um, but I do a number of those. I'm handling something I'm super proud of and is um, only something we've started doing in the last couple of years. We do diversity screenwriting lists throughout the years. The first of those was the GLAD list, uh, where we partnered with GLAD to highlight LGBTQ storytelling. And now we've uh, sort of expanded that to include the CAPE list, which highlights Asian American and Pacific Islander storytelling. Uh, we're working on the Muslim list to highlight Muslim storytelling. The Latinx list, we've done a TV version. We've done a feature version. Um, we've done the disability list to highlight um, storytellers with disabilities. And that's been really incredible, too, to sort of um, be able to elevate a lot of those voices that are traditionally overlooked by the industry. And, you know, there is the sort of X factor of film and TV production and doing that all of that sort of you know everything from hey I read the script on the website I think it's really great I think the rest of the team should take a look at it to you know we have to hire an editor for this project let's you know check all of those avails and and get that person hired to we have to watch a cut of a movie to you know we're thinking about staffing up a room on a tv show so it's really a little bit of everything and I think everybody on the blacklist team would say that but what's exciting about that is it does create a lot of room for growth. It creates a lot of room for expansion. Um, you know, Franklin is one of those people who you bring an idea to him and 99 times out of 100, if you have a good plan to execute it, he's going to be on board. And I've seen that, you know, for me personally, things I've done like the last great video store project or, you know, many years ago, I uh, did a feminist horror series on the Blacklist blog. But, you know, we just want to be the sort of home for screenwriters in the industry where they are traditionally overlooked. They are traditionally not valued in the way that they should be. Um, you know, one of my pet peeves is a movie comes out and you'll see a director do this sort of tour of of media. And it's like, yeah, but I want to talk to the writer. Like, I want to know where all this came from, where all of this started. Or when the writer's name is left out of an announcement when a new when a movie touches an actor or a director. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, you get those like awards announcements and it'll list the scripts and then none of the writers and you're like, so did this just like fall out itself. of the sky on La Brea and somebody was like, let's make this movie? Um, yeah, so we just want to be that sort of home base for writers in the industry at all levels of their career to get advice and feedback and, you know, sort of work on their craft. And I, I do have to shout out Scott Myers, who runs Going to the Story, who is the official screenwriting blog of The Blacklist. I, you know, I am a person who went to film school and there are moments where I'm like reading a post on Scott's blog where I'm like, why did I go to film school? Like, this is better advice <laughs> and sort of guidance than I got anywhere else so yeah you know just providing those resources to writers to allow them to thrive and to allow them to grow and share their stories with the world that's awesome i mean supporting writers is what we're all about too um, how did how did you find your way to the blacklist? So you mentioned you were reading there. What were you doing before then? You know, I I like telling this story because I definitely don't have the traditional inroad to Hollywood, and I think it's important to talk about um, sort of alternative ways to get into the business that aren't the sort of expected routes that that people take. So I moved out here in um, spring of 2012. I did my last semester of college out here. I went to Columbia College, and they had a really great program called. Called semester in LA where you come and you do your final semester of college out here with the expectation that you'll stay so did that did a couple of internships to varying success levels and then had to get a real job, you know, was running out of my sort of college nest egg and it was time to go be a grown up and I sent out probably 400 emails, applications, etc. for assistant jobs because that had been sort of presented to me as the traditional route of getting into the industry. But I quickly realized, you know, I would be on these these open calls with these like, you know, leggy blondes and, you know, I'm not getting that job. Like I'm short and fat and like don't sort of fit the traditional Hollywood mold of like what a Hollywood person looks like. So I was like, OK, I sort of understand the name of the game. Um, but throughout that time, I was still reading a lot. You know, I had I had interned at Bold Films um, for Stephanie Wilcox, and Stephanie was kind enough to sort of like keep me on as one of her, as someone who was doing reading for her after the internship ended. 
And she was able to provide me with some oppor- further opportunities as a reader. And then I also interned um, at a company called Evolution Entertainment, which doesn't exist anymore. And I had interned for Megan Math is there. And the reason I mentioned her specifically is because the whole reason I got the blacklist job is I had done a year in LAUSD. I was like teaching. I was doing other stuff. I was like, I don't know if this movie stuff is going to happen. Like, what am I doing in Los Angeles? Like, I'm reading, but I'm not really like getting anywhere. And Megan interviewed me or Megan emailed me on the last day of a job that I had had that I was really like, what am I going to do next? Like, I, you know, my school contract ended and like, I literally don't know how I'm going to pay the bills. And she's like, hey, uh, the blacklist is hiring readers for the first time. And I think you would be really great for it. So I applied. I got hired really quickly. But I think the important part of that story is, you know, I I tell people all the time. It's like the only two things you can control in this business is how hard you're willing to work and how you treat other people. And like, you know, Megan and I had a good relationship. And because of that, she was like, hey, I will sort of give you the inside line on this blacklist hiring. If I had been a jerk to Megan, she's maybe not sending that email. So, you know, it is interesting thinking all those little points that your sort of Hollywood career pivots on. But yeah, I got hired by the blacklist as a reader in August 2013. I read uh, 300 scripts in about six months. I was my full time gig. And then sort of the position to start helping out with um, customer support, web community, all of that stuff opened up. And, you know, Franklin knew me a bit from being a reader, but the first time we met in person was actually my job interview, which is kind of funny. Uh, And yeah, it's just been super exciting since then. You know, I, I really think Blacklist is the thing that has kind of changed everything for me personally. Um, it's definitely given me a really excellent sort of path through the industry. And I just hope that we can continue doing that for, for other writers and creatives as well. You know, at the end of the day, like, we all just want to see some great movies get made. Like, it's not more complicated than that. Like, we want to have a great TV show to kick back with at the end of the night. And a lot of times, you know, that's going to include uh, elevating some diverse perspectives that haven't been sort of traditionally celebrated by the industry. So, you know, I it, there are many things that the Blacklist does, but I think that's sort of paramount to all that we do is, you know, making sure that storytellers feel safe and supported in a way so that they can do their best work and that we can all watch some better movies. <laughs> For sure. I mean, I guess I read um, Franklin's op-ed or uh, piece in the New York Times and, you know, beyond just like, you know, making good stuff it's also just better business um. 100% <laughs> yeah it's just it's a no brainer guys like i don't know one of my sort of guiding lights in the industry is just like would I have been into this as a teenager like would i have thought this was cool or like would i have thought this was like try hard or silly or you know outright bad like whatever that sort of looks like and yeah I think about the kind of stuff I wanted to see as a teenager which is not that different from the stuff I want to see as an adult but it, you you start to realize how how few crumbs many of us have, have existed on for many years when it comes to representative storytelling and feeling like you know everybody's voice is sort of included in these narratives and yeah it's just it shouldn't be this hard guys <laughs> Really shouldn't. Uh, so you, you know, I, you you started out as a reader there. You were you were doing reading before. You've read a lot of scripts. I, it sounds like, as a reader, what are you know to the writers out there listening who you know submit their scripts all over the place? Can you just talk about a little you know give a little perspective to you know what you're what you're doing as a reader? You know how you're evaluating scripts, what you look for, because it sounds like you've got the mileage. Yeah. And, you know, I will say, too, it's, you know, none of those muscles have ever really atrophied. Like, I'm still taking a lot of things I I implemented and used as a reader in my sort of career with the Blacklist, especially as we start doing more sort of working with writers for personal projects and developing stories and, um, you know, working through multiple drafts of things. All of those skills that I learned as a reader remain super important to me. Um, You know, I wish there was a sort of magic formula that I could share that sort of makes one script stand out from the pack. Um, But I think for me, two of the biggest things come down to personal voice and tone. I am willing to go, you know, if you have a strong personal voice, I literally do not care what a script is about. But if you are 
giving me personality, if you are giving me a specific story world I haven't seen before, if you are giving me um, characters who do surprising things, characters who feel authentic to sort of real life um, analogs, if you are exploring some thematic ideas that feel both universal and true to you, I think that goes a really, really long way in terms of just sort of being like, this story is mine and I am the person to tell it and here is why. Because, you know, we can all write like fun genre stuff and I love that stuff. I love reading that stuff, but I'm always looking for that sort of personal touch. Like, why is this person particularly telling this story? And then tone is something that I would say like is a problem for me just like generally with many things that I see and experience now. And obviously tone is like not the easiest thing to sort of pin down or define. But I think about a movie like Parasite, which juggles, you know, many tones throughout its runtime that is exploring many kinds of emotional moods and I don't mean creating a consistent tone it's I mean you know being able to balance all of those sort of shifts whether it's for plot or for character or for you know the mechanics of the story just being able to create a mood and a vibe on the page that you're like you know I just want to hang out in this world or oh man I really don't want to hang out in this world because you've so effectively like (laughs) rendered whatever hellscape this might be but you know I think about many of my favorite movies the reasons are my favorite movies are because they sort of nail the tonal specifics and you know I I think it's sort of the special sauce that a lot of stuff is missing now it's you know a lot of stuff is perfectly fine and good but it doesn't have that sort of I think this gets back to the personal voice thing too it doesn't have that sort of like personality that sort of Mm -hmm. overarching like why is the story being told? Why is it being told this way? Um, so, yeah. And I mean, you know, I I will say things too, like people get really hung up on stuff like formatting. Let me tell you, I have never, if a script is great, I have never once been like, oh, you didn't format your off-screen <laughs> dialogue correctly. I, no reader is going to care about that. You underlined your slug line. Ugh. Yeah, all of that stuff. And look, you got to know the fundamentals. You got to know formatting. But like, it's not going to be make or break if you've told a great story. Just like end of the day. I I would say for me, you know, as somebody who has done screenwriting too, the hardest struggle has always been dialogue and like making making distinctive character voices, making sure that the characters aren't just avatars for, you know, iterations of yourself and you're Mm -hmm. just sort of doing that. Um, And, you know, be, be a really curious observer, read plays, watch old movies, listen to people talk on a park bench, maybe not during COVID, but you know what I mean. All of these sort of like things that really just make you a better human beyond being a better writer, just being a more sort of present human in the world and, you know, understanding that it's like, oh, this director stole this shot from this other director, but actually they stole it from somebody before them. And just, you know, having an appreciation for all of that kind of stuff in the media stew um, as we try to tell really interesting stories. Couldn't agree with that more. So you work the Blacklist, you do some internships, you were in film school. What was, the, where? take us back to what ignited your love of storytelling and filmmaking and screenwriting in the first place? Can you pinpoint it? You know, I don't have like a specific, like I watched this movie and I decided I wanted to make movies. I was always a kid who loved movies. Uh, My parents are big movie fans. And then my maternal grandmother, my Mima, was also a really big movie fan. And a lot of times I would hang out at her house on weekends. And she, you know, my folks were watching current stuff. They were renting things like Welcome to the Dollhouse and Boogie Nights and Happiness. But my Mima would be like, we're going to watch The King and I. We're going to watch God with the wind we're gonna watch psycho and that was when i really started like appreciating the like totality of of movies i actually i realized yesterday uh this is my 25th oscars because the first oscars i ever watched was when uh babe lost a braveheart and like that was <laughs> at her house i remember doing that at her house but yeah you know i like many kids i love star wars um i would say the first director i ever got really obsessed with was john hughes because that was the first director director that I could be like oh this is a style there are callbacks to other things he's done actors sort of get 
ported over from one movie to the mm-hmm. other. Like, this is an aesthetic sensibility. I will say, you know, a huge movie for me in high school was going to see Marie Antoinette and seeing a female director sort of remix this, like, stodgy period thing into something really fresh and contemporary and just exciting for what the what the medium could do and i have a a funny anecdote about that one there is a shot in marie antoinette where kirsten dunce is on a balcony and sort of just looking out at the gardens and i remember being in the movie theater and thinking like oh my god that's the like the most beautiful thing i've ever seen like do i maybe want to (laughs) make movies um so that happens i sort of like see that as a like entry point to be like oh women can make movies women can you know do this thing so it's like 10 years later and i'm watching barry Lyndon for the first time (laughs) and i realize that that shot is just a mirror of a shot in barry Lyndon, which honestly just made me appreciate it more because you realize that like even our favorite directors are just stealing from their favorite directors too and he was just Uh, stealing from paintings so yeah yeah and it was a nice like oh right like we're all just fans at the end Mm -hmm. of the day but you know i i still like even when i made the decision to make, go to film school I still had this like am I really gonna be allowed to do this is somebody really gonna like let me talk about movies and do movie stuff all the time as a job <laughs> like yeah and it's you know it's it's been really interesting watching all of that stuff evolve as I've been out in Los Angeles and sort of you know building a career with a blacklist and beyond yeah it's I'm always fascinated by people though that have that sort of like singular movie experience that they were like this is the thing that 100% made me want to make movies or I love the opposite of that answer too which you know I've heard people give of like oh yeah I want to make movies I don't really like movies I don't really yeah, watch that, movies that one's always really surprising to me the people who are like yeah I'm not a huge movie person I don't watch a lot of stuff it, and like they fell into the career like later you know they were like at college and was like oh I'll give that a try I guess and yeah like, and like I don't know I sort of understand that for like more technical positions like directors sure. photography editors things like that where it's about the process as much but like I remember being in film school and you know fellow students would be like oh I've never seen The Godfather I've never seen yeah titanic just like very <laughs> popular films and yeah. you're like why are you in film school <laughs> yeah <laughs> no I, I i know that exact feeling um so the last year has been plus year plus has been tremendously challenging obviously for for a lot of people how have how has how have things changed for you you know you're at home now but like is have you been able to is business as usual for the blacklist you're just working from home how you know what's your experience been like you know we were incredibly lucky because we had actually worked from home for many years prior to this we were in an office when covid hit but it was not super difficult for us to sort of slot back into the the work from home vibe because we had done it for many years but it's been super interesting you know in some ways i think blacklist has been busier than ever as people have time to read as people have time time to really think deeply about story, write screenplays, finally like find some time in their lives to tell the story they want to tell. So we've been incredibly fortunate and I'm very grateful for it that, you know, we've been able to weather the storms of this year pretty well. But, you know, personally, it's been weird. I I think everybody and, you know, I see that as a pretty privileged white lady who's been super lucky through this whole pandemic. It's very strange, you know, these sort of reward systems that we used to give ourselves like, oh, I'm going to kick back and watch a movie. It's like, yeah, but that's the only thing we've been able to do for a year. But, you know, I'll say personally, like I last year and then this year as well so far, like I have not watched more movies than I have watched in the last two years, which has been really nice. And just like, Mm -hmm. you know, I think I've also like stopped caring if a movie is going to be good or not. It's just (laughs) like is somebody in it that I like? Is this like a fun premise? Is this from an era that I appreciate? Like I'm watching all of the 80s teen movies that I haven't seen and that is a deep well. But yeah, it's, you know, I I do think it's really cool to see how many folks have really gotten to the point where they have a screenplay that they're ready to upload to the Blacklist website because of the pandemic and they've been able to find that time in their lives that maybe didn't exist previously. Um, But yeah, you know, I think everybody still has a lot of questions about what going back to production is going to look like, what going back to movie theaters is going to look like, what an award season might look like. Because, you know, 
we've been pretty fortunate in the States to get pretty vaccinated pretty quickly. But for the rest of the world, that isn't necessarily the case. And, you know, as we sort of think about an international happening like a a Cannes or a Toronto or something, you're like, is this even going to be possible given yeah. given the way the rest of the world is is dealing with the pandemic? But yeah, it's you know, I don't think anybody has any like genius answers or like sadly now (laughs) yeah we're all just doing (laughs) our best every day (laughs) yeah yeah i mean i agree with you the one silver one of the only silver linings has been watching a ton of movies and catching up on stuff that i never would have or that i've always been meaning to like over the weekend i watched um heartbreak kid which was the last elaine may movie i hadn't seen i know it's not a deep she's only did four movies but like you know one of those filmmakers i've always been meaning around to, to get around to and finally getting to it's like oh that's awesome like you know four masterpieces i didn't know existed before but yeah i'm getting back to movie theaters and getting back out there it's going to be interesting you know i saw someone joking last night about bringing it back to the oscars that it was very relatable that most of the people there did seemed very uncomfortable with in-person uh conversation they didn't know how to like watching the pre-show red carpet stuff nobody really knew what they were doing they were all incredibly uncomfortable (laughs) yeah Um, yeah i mean like i hung out with more than two people for the first time in a year in LA on Friday night and we were all just like uh I you know we're doing fine everybody's trying their best but it is just weird I I've thought about the going back to movie theaters conversation and it's like you know I'm fully vaccinated at this point but I'm still like oh I don't know is this okay do I really want to go sit in a room with strangers like oh I don't know yet I went I went to like a a, a matinee uh when it was at like a 25 percent capacity and that felt very, it was a big, it was a big auditorium. So it felt safe. And as someone who goes to the movies alone a lot or used to anyway, I kind of preferred it <laughs> in yeah. a weird way, <laughs> having the capacity limits on it. But I do agree that like, yeah, getting back into like a packed house, shoulder to shoulder pe- with people, even fully vaccinated, I'm, I'm apprehensive. We'll see. It's yeah. going to be a slow, be slow getting back to it. And you want to support, you know, I can't wait to go back to the new Beverly. I've been thinking so much, particularly about the, you know, independent theaters who have just been sort of left on their own to figure it out this year. And you want to be there and you want to support. But it's that constant dance of like, okay, but am I, you know, supporting my own health? Am I doing the responsible thing for the community? All of these questions that we just like never even thought about previously. Yeah, I, it will be back to normal when I can go to El Coyote and, and the New Beverly. That's yeah. my like, bar, that's my bar for like, okay, things are back to normal. Yeah, um, give me one of those overly strong margaritas before I go <laughs> see the double feature. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, just uh, as we wrap up, you know, you mentioned earlier that, you know, part of one of the reasons you, you know, you found your way to the blacklist was, you know, um, someone you'd worked with previously giving you a good recommendation and, you know, connections are, and being nice to people is obviously very important because, this town is incestuous and you never know where your next job's gonna be. You never know where that assistant who you treated like crap is gonna be next. They could be in a position to hire or fire you. And also it's just good karma to be nice to people. Beyond that, is there any advice you'd offer to people who are, you know, thinking about, you know, working in the industry, maybe moving to LA? Is there any anything that you think would be helpful for, for them to know? You know, I, I do think that the industry sort of pushes uh, one kind of networking and one kind of like being a Hollywood player on people. And that doesn't work for everybody. You know, I'm an introverted person. I'm an only child. Like I do better with people one-on-one than I will ever do at like a big networking event or a big group. So I figured out pretty early on that like for me, networking looks like being really active on Twitter. And like, you know, there were times when I was like, active on things like reddit and things like that too but just sort of figuring out you how you best thrive and the environments you can put yourself into that are sort of gonna help you flourish like you know i thinking of myself like i i think we've all gone to some of those like networking things when you first move here and i remember just being like filled with terror at a couple of those of like i don't know what to do i don't know what i'm supposed to like I don't know how I'm supposed to interact with these people. And, you know, I think that's a me problem ultimately, but just figuring out that it's like, okay, maybe that's not what networking looks like for me. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just different. I will say if you are serious about being in the film industry, I do think you have to move to Los Angeles at some point. I understand that it is prohibitively expensive for a lot of people and that the sort of access point is exclusionary in and of itself. But there's just so much much sort of 
extra that happens when you are here that you can't account for if you don't live here. Like we were just talking about being at the New Beverly in El Coyote. It's like, oh, I went to go see a movie at the New Beverly and this person was there and we had this really nice conversation after the movie. And then, you know, it's two months later and suddenly they have an adaptation job for me or it's award season. So I'm going to a bunch of screenings. So I met a critic um, who, you know, their brother is a great DP for my short. All of that kind of networking stuff, like I just think is really hard to do not here. So don't rush that decision. Don't sort of push yourself to do that before it's time. But I do think it's something most people need to think seriously about. My other sort of vibe on that would be, you know, we sort of have these expectations about the jobs that you have to have in the industry and the paths you have to take to get to where you want to be. But I also think that there's absolutely nothing wrong with keeping a nine to five that keeps you sane and takes very little of your emotional energy so that you can focus on whatever creative stuff you want to do. I think that's a path we need to talk about more. You know, I've known people who have found success as writers and other creatives because they had these jobs where they could just sort of go and leave it there and then all of their sort of creative attention could come back to them. So if you're working an assistant job that, you know, keeps you 90 hours a week and your boss is horrible and you're so burnt out and you're so tired and you have no time for anything else, like, yeah, that might lead you where you want to go. But it also might not. And like, really, that's sort of getting back to the thing of knowing yourself, of like knowing the things that are going to help you most and how you can best excel, I think, is is really important. But yeah, you know, watch a lot of movies, read a lot of screenplays, especially the bad ones. Be aware of industry trends. Like, it's shocking to me how many people don't read the trades every day, (laughs) don't read like, you know, big profiles of people in the industry, things like that. And I also think, too, people don't place enough emphasis on sort of developing your class of peers at the same level as you. Like, obviously, we all have these sort of aspirational pie in the sky folks that we would like to to be like, to work with, et cetera. But you also need to make sure that you're surrounding yourself with a group of your peers that's uh, on the ascent, too, and are, you know, striving for similar things to you so that you can be there to help each other, to celebrate each other's successes, to commiserate when things are not going well. That's super important. Just like finding whatever your community is, whatever, however that looks for you, and just to having those folks you can go to when things are not going your way, because they won't, because it's Los Angeles. And just being able to be resilient with within all those failures and and realize that it's all stepping stones and that things are leading you exactly where they're supposed to be. I think that's awesome. Um, Kate, where can people find you on the, on um, the webs? Yeah, I'm on Twitter, on Instagram at that Hagen girl, uh, T-H-A-T-H-A-G-E-N-G-R-R-L. Otherwise, I'm on Medium. You can read a lot of my work there. Um, wrote a piece for Playboy in winter 2019 about the state of the cinematic sex scene. Spoiler alerts, it's not great. Not great. Um, not great. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> you know, give me a shout. I'm pretty active on Twitter. And uh, let's watch some good movies. <laughs> yes, please. Thank you so much for chatting today. This was a ton fun yeah thanks for having me thanks again to kate hagan from the blacklist for coming on the show and as always thanks to you our listeners if you like this episode leave us a review and if you haven't already subscribe on apple spotify stitcher or wherever you get your podcasts for news about future episodes and more like us on facebook follow us on twitter at final draft inc and instagram at final draft screenwriting This episode was produced by Kayla Guess with help from associate producer Emma Vranich. Music by T. Kelly. Thanks again, everyone. Until next time, right on. 